On the 7th of April 2016, police were called to a flat in South London after neighbours had complained about a putrid smell. He opened up the letterbox and he said, can you smell it now? And I said to him, do you know what it smells like? It smells like a dead body. Two police officers knocked on the door and the occupant, 49-year-old Stefano Brizzi, answered. He said, I, I've killed a police officer. Um, Satan uh, told me to do it. I promised Satan that I would kill at the first opportunity. Inside the flat was a scene of unimaginable horror. They go into the bath room, and the bath is full of globules of fat, and they find remnants of the body. Stefano Brizzi had killed a police officer in a drug fueled sexual encounter. He then went on to dispose of the body in the most horrifying way and became one of the world's most evil killers. On the 7th of April 2016, when two police officers arrived at the Peabody estate on Southwark Street in South London, they made a gruesome discovery inside one of the flats. They found the remains of 59-year-old police officer Gordon Semple, who'd been missing for six days. Neighbours had alerted the police after they noticed a bad smell. The tenant, 49-year-old Italian national Stefano Brizzi, had been trying to dispose of Gordon Semple's body after killing him the previous week. Tess de la Mer reported on the case. We got a phone call from a neighbour saying something's been found. I believe it's the, the police officer. Initially, we had very little information. We know that he'd been found on the Peabody estate. When I and a colleague went down, it was cordoned off. At that point, we didn't know exactly what had gone on. Um, I think in hindsight, it was a lot more chilling than it actually it felt at the time. At the time, it just felt like um, a relatively straightforward murder. On the 1st of April 2016, a week before the shocking discovery, Stefano Brizzi had used the online dating app Grindr to meet men. And it was at that point that he contacted, again, through the dating app, a policeman called Gordon Semple. They were essentially both looking for, for somebody to hook up with and have sex with. And this is the, the one thing that, that really amazes me about this app, is that it enables people to see who's geographically proximate and interested in the same thing that you are. And, and the speed at which this happens, with which they meet and with which Gordon Semple loses his life, really is quite incredible. This killer's story begins over 50 years ago. Stefano Brizzi was born into a devout Catholic family in San Marcello de Pistoiesi in the Italian region of Tuscany on the 26th of June 1966. He was aware of his sexuality from an early age. He knew he was a homosexual, but Brizzi also knew he was a Catholic. And that not only is against his religion, but it would really upset his parents. <laughs> if they were that religious. So he was in that kind of turmoil. I think his homosexuality haunted him. He felt that somehow it wasn't what his family would have approved of. He felt that he was out of step with his family. Rizzi went to the university in Florence, which is a, a very reputable um, university in Italy, not very far from, from where he was born and where he lived. From the university, he graduated and he got a very good job as a computer programmer in Italy as well. In 2008, age 42, Brizzi was diagnosed with hepatitis C and as HIV positive. I think he would have felt quite a sense of shame. He would have felt some sense of responsibility for the situation that he found himself in. Uh, and I think he would have really felt that guilt. I mean, it's, it seems almost stereotypical to talk about Catholic guilt, but, but I think that's certainly what was going on with him. 
In 2012, age 46, Fritzi decided to move to London for a better income and a different lifestyle. I think when Britsy first arrived in London, he would have felt quite liberated. He's moved away from, from Florence and, and his family and that quite rigid Catholic set of values that was so instrumental in his upbringing. He's come to live in this diverse, exciting city where I think for the first time in his life, he can be himself. And I think this is quite a positive time for him. He was intelligent, IT expert, well-trained, and coming away from his native Italy meant that he could perhaps escape some of the family ties. He could reinvent himself, if you like. In 2012, Britsy found work with a merchant bank as an IT consultant and a web developer, earning £70,000 a year. He seems to be working in an industry that is quite kind of hedonistic in terms of culture. It's quite kind of fond of instant gratification. And you don't really have very much in the way of breaks on your behavior. You're encouraged to basically work hard and play hard. And I think that's where the problems begin. I think the guilt he'd found himself suffering in Italy was not completely dissipated by changing countries. In 2013, Britsy started experimenting with drugs, including GHB and poppers. He soon became immersed in a world of substance abuse and eventually became addicted to crystal meth. Now, in itself, one can only feel sorry for him because it's a dreadful addiction. It's very, very hard to uh, attack and to overcome. But to some extent, he tried. Britsy joined a support group to help overcome his addiction. Britsy does seem to be quite a, a dramatic and quite a, an elaborate individual. And, and some of his behavior uh, around his crystal meth addiction really does highlight that. He reached a point where he was going to a support group and he wanted to leave his addiction behind. He conducted a, a funeral service for his crystal meth addiction. I think at one point he even constructed a coffin for it and said he was burying his addiction. He was basically saying, this is it, this is over, I'm burying this part of me and I'm moving on. And you can see those, those roots of his upbringing there, that idea of the Catholic faith and of ceremony and of ritual. He's drawing on those traditional values, those traditional beliefs in this new lifestyle. So I think here we've got somebody who's incredibly conflicted. He's somebody who feels like he should be a good Catholic boy. He knows that his behavior isn't going to come up to the expectations of his family and his community. And He's really struggling. Britsy wrestled to overcome his addiction, and in 2015, he eventually lost his job. His life was beginning to fall apart. It would be fair to say that Britsy was disintegrating. He became more and more introverted, almost nocturnal. He completely covered the windows of his flat so that no light came in. He didn't go out very much during the day at all. He became addicted to an American television show called Breaking Bad, in which at one point two of the main characters try to dissolve the body of a drug dealer in a bath of acid, which for one reason or another struck a chord in Britsy. Britsy fell into a dark world of his own creation, a blurred reality between fiction and fantasy. I think he really did adopt this, this Breaking Bad narrative. He went along to a support group wearing a Breaking Bad T-shirt. Now, what that says to me is that this is somebody who's not thinking through the social acceptability of their actions. And this is somebody who needs help. And I think at, at this point, there were quite a few red flags. So you have a man who is literally falling apart, is descended into a kind of madness of his own creation fueled by crystal meth, fascinated by sex, 
desperately keen to have what he called chem sex parties. Chem sex is pretty much a party or a get together where is exactly what this says on the tin. It's a party that's fueled by chemicals and it's a sex party. The two biggest chemicals are used in the community for sex parties are ketamine and crystal meth. Two big reasons, ketamine is a horse tranquilizer. It kills your gagging effect. And crystal meth, because you don't sleep on it. The second reason why crystal meth is very used, it's known as a huge aphrodisiac. Uh, once you take it, your libido just goes crazy and you just, you don't stop. Britsy would use the online gay dating app Grinder to regularly meet men for chem sex parties. It's an escapism from the real life. You know, it's, it's like nothing they've ever seen before. And a lot of people, when they do something completely different, they go, wow, I love this. Britsy became immersed in a world fueled by drugs and sex and would often go on chem sex binges for days. I think that Britsy really wanted to participate in, in a culture in which he felt that, that he belonged, in which he felt accepted. So I think he really did want to embrace it all part and parcel. I think it started off being quite fun, quite exciting, and then it became like a full-blown addiction that he just couldn't manage. Stefano Britsy's chaotic lifestyle was quickly spiralling out of control. He was unemployed and living alone in his flat in Southwark, London. He'd become immersed in a world of drug and sex addiction. The people who were around him don't necessarily have his best interests at heart, and there's nobody to really step back and say, hang on a minute, you know, you, you might want to, to be careful here. In terms of his lifestyle, there are lots of enabling factors, but very little in the way of constraining factors. He was living a very sort of hermit-like existence. He was um, only really going out at night. He wasn't, he wasn't working. He was um, not interacting with many people um, socially. He was using the Grindr app an awful lot, but he wasn't having sort of normal, everyday social interactions, such as like going to the pub or things like that. On the afternoon of the 1st of April 2016, Stefano Brizzi exchanged messages with a man on Grinder and invited him round to his flat for sex. The man in question was 59-year-old policeman Gordon Semple. Emily Penning is a correspondent at the Old Bailey. Gordon Semple was from Inverness originally in Scotland and he worked for the Bank of Scotland in Inverness and then moved down to London where he became a police officer 30 years ago. He was working at the City Hall in Westminster as part of an antisocial behaviour team. He was very popular with his friends. His brother described him as a Dixon of Dot Green kind of character, the kind of beat Bobby who would solve crimes with common sense in the community. Um, so he was a friendly guy and he was very much well liked. At approximately 3 p.m., Gordon Semple got off a tube train at Blackfriars Station and made his way to Britsy's flat on the Peabody estate. Gordon Semple and Stefano Britsy didn't know each other, they'd never met. They had arranged to meet for, for casual sex. It was the middle of the day, it was a working day. Um, we know that Gordon Semple was on duty. According to Britsy, the two men spent the afternoon having sex and contacted other men via gay fetish apps. There were other people who were, had kind of indicated that they were interested in coming to this sort of, this rendezvous. At around 7 p.m. that evening, another man responded to the messages and arrived at Britsy's flat. Another of the men that Britsy invited to take part in the said chem sex party rang the doorbell. And after a while, Britsy answers and says, actually, somebody's fallen ill. It's OK that they're, they're getting treatment. The party's over. But Britsy was lying. At some point, after arriving at his flat, Stefano Britsy had murdered PC Gordon Semple behind closed doors. The night before they actually met, Britsy had been 
irritated and he'd had ver virtually no sleep and he'd been let down by another man that he'd been talking to on Grinder. He'd taken it quite personally. So even before they met, Britsy was irritated and fractious and tired. And I think he took it out on Gordon Semple. It is unclear exactly what happened at Britsy's flat, but according to Britsy, the two men engaged in sadomasochistic sex acts that involved a collar, a mask, and a dog lead. At some point during the, the course of events, Gordon had lost his life. He'd agreed to some bondage activity with Britsy, and it's believed that, that Gordon was strangled, and that's how he died. So precisely why reduced oxygen supply to the brain enhances orgasm and sexual pleasure, it's not something that's tremendously well understood, but it is very well recognised. And for forensic pathologists, finding autoerotic accidents is not uncommon. With pressure on the neck, there is only about 10 seconds before somebody loses consciousness if the pressure is too high. That means that if you don't have some sort of fail-safe in an autoerotic event, you can die very quickly because you lose consciousness and you can't save yourself. Now, Britsy at one point tried to suggest that he'd been using the lead to heighten the level of sexual excitement, a familiar enough uh, thing in both heterosexual and homosexual relationships, cutting off the oxygen supply said to heighten the orgasm. The interplay between pressure on the neck and sexual activity can be very, very difficult to work out when it stops being an inexperienced person in an accident and when it becomes deliberate homicide. In the days leading up to Gordon Semple's death, Stefano Brizzi had been abusing drugs, including crystal meth, for several days. Something like methamphetamine is a stimulant. Very similar effect to something like cocaine. They get you high, you're more active, more agile. Sometimes core body temperature goes up. They're getting you agitated rather than calmed. Stimulant drugs like methamphetamine can have significant psychological and psychiatric effects, make people unstable, make them unpredictable. They can have all sorts of very damaging consequences. He lived in an extraordinary fantasy world of nocturnal oblivion, and so he just decided to kill him. I think it probably just came over him. I'm going to kill him. And he duly did. He did not know that Semple was a police officer. He was not aware that anyone would particularly miss Gordon Semple. I think that the circumstances around Gordon Semple's death were incredibly chaotic. And I think at this point, he really was starting to panic. I think that drug-induced haze was perhaps starting to pass. And he realizes what, what he's done. He realizes that somebody has died in his flat and he really does need to, to work out what he's going to do next. Britsy was addicted to crystal meth and had reportedly been abusing the drug the night of the murder. Crystal meth is a known drug for the escalation of it. You start slow and it's amazing. You, you feel completely out of your body and you feel powerful and everything. But then you start taking more and more because you need more and more because the effect is too strong and they go into the paranoia phase. They will have hallucinations, they'll have paranoia, they'll have schizophrenia. They will see people that are not there. They will see things that are not there. It's a whole thing when, once you get to the third phase. And Britsy was on that phase. As Gordon Semple lay dead in Britsy's flat, his long-term partner was expecting to meet him later that evening. On the day that PC Semple disappeared, he discussed with his partner what they were going to do that evening. They'd arranged to meet at a local pub near where they were living in Dartford, and they'd talked about having shepherd's pie for dinner 
was already in the fridge, ready and waiting for them. And they talked about recording a reality TV show that they both liked so that they could watch it later. Unaware that Gordon had arranged to meet Bretzi, his concern grew. Gordon Semple's partner had become frantic with worry after he couldn't get hold of him uh, on the night of his disappearance. He'd phoned him 18 times over the course of an hour and a half and been unable to get through, was leaving messages on his aunt's phone. The next morning, he reported him missing to the police. On Monday the 4th of April, three days after the murder, the caretaker of the Peabody estate started to notice a strange smell coming from Britz's flat. The caretaker didn't have any idea what happened. He knew it was a very bad smell. They had different theories about drains, and they initially thought that the occupier of the flat might have died. Steve Harris lives in the flat above Britz's on the Peabody estate. I walked in through the fletching, and the porter came up to me and said to me, um, excuse me, there's been a complaint. And I thought he was talking about me. Then he went on to a, a complaint about a smell in the block. But where I live at the top, I didn't realise what was going on. So we both walked up into the block. He said to me, can you smell it now? A little bit. So what he'd what he done, he opened up the letterbox. And he said to me, can you smell it now? And I said to him, yes. Do you know what it smells like? It smells like a dead body. The idea of a dead body in the building was hard to contemplate. Now, I've never smelt a dead body in my entire life. So he wanted to call the police. I'll come back up here, I'm up the window, had a fag, then all of a sudden, when like people turn their century and you've got an outside flu. So I'm looking out the window and I thought to myself, well, hold on a minute, mate. We just talked at your door. You didn't answer. So how comes your central eating's on? I went downstairs on my own. I looked for the letterbox. He walked straight past and opened up the door. I said, excuse me, mate. I said, um, there's been a complaint about the smell in the block. So he's gone to me. Well, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm just cooking for a friend. Fair enough. I went back downstairs to the porter and I said to him, don't bother calling up the police, he's in. The smell of the dead body was clearly attracting attention and Britsy had to dispose of it quickly. Britsy, after the killing, he went to a DIY store and bought various different items, uh, including buckets, rubber gloves, cleaning products, large perforated metal sheet, which he used as part of the dismemberment of the body. Britsy tries to dispose of Gordon's body in the same way that the Walter White character in Breaking Bad tries to dispose of a corpse. He buys acid, he tries to dissolve parts of Gordon's body, he dismembers him. He'd bought a combination of chemicals from a local hardware store. He didn't have exactly what he needed. I think he just thought he was going to make a cocktail and um, hope that it was going to have the effect that he wanted, but it only had a partial effect. The truth is, it is very difficult to reduce a body to so little evidence that nothing will be found or nothing significant will be found. Yes, things like acids will damage the body, but very unlikely to destroy it to the point where something can't be found. To completely dissolve a body, you're going to need very, very powerful chemicals, much stronger than you'd get over the counter, and you're going to need a long time and somewhere to do it that you're not going to get discovered, practically speaking, outside of the world of TV programmes. It's not a way to get rid of a body. It really is incredibly gruesome, and this suggests to me that this isn't somebody who is disgusted. This isn't somebody who is abhorred by, by what's going on. And I think by this point, Britsy has become so kind of saturated with drugs. He's become so detached from reality that that line between fiction and, and reality really is completely crossed and completely blurred. 
He also went on Grinder and tried to cover his tracks and lay a false trail to put anyone off from suspecting that anything had happened that was untoward. He disposed of other body parts by taking them and throwing them into the river. And the disintegration then takes over, trapped in this tiny flat, blackened windows, with Gordon Semple's body. It is almost impossible to imagine what that must have been like. On Sunday the 3rd of April, the Metropolitan Police, unaware of the fate of PC Gordon Semple, launched an official missing persons appeal for their colleague. He'd been missing for two days. By now, the smell coming from Brits's flat was becoming unbearable. On Thursday the 7th of April, Steve Harris and his brother decided to confront Britsy again. We both walked up. He uh, uh, um, approached the door. He's got his little card made that he was a Sweeney. He opened up the door and the same sort of thing is, um, he's got, I'm sorry, mate, I'm, I'm, I'm cooking for my friend. That was it. However, the brothers weren't convinced and called 999. An ambulance was dispatched to Britsy's flat. The ambulance turned up. Whether or not they got into his place or not, I don't know. But they must have smelled this smell. When they come back down again, I said to the woman, what's it smelled of? She said, it smelled like, it smells like rotten flesh. Well, when we brother looked at each other and it's to say like, well, something ain't right. The police arrived after the paramedics and two officers knocked on the door of Brits's flat. They weren't murder squad detectives. They were local police and they didn't really know what to expect. Stefano Brizzi answered the door, wearing a pair of pink Speedos and aviator sunglasses. There was this horrendous smell coming from the flat, and he said, I, I've killed a police officer. Um, Satan uh, told me to do it. I promised Satan that I would kill at the first opportunity. And these two police officers were confronted with a man who was possibly very, very dangerous. I think they initially thought that he was, he was insane, and they decided not to arrest him initially. They just decided to let him talk. This is a man who has lost contact with the planet, really. And he says, oh, yes, I've cut him up. I've dismembered him. I think the, the women police constable was probably completely confused by this. What on earth are you talking about? Well, yes, I, I killed him. And they go into the bathroom. It's an extraordinary descent into madness. The scene inside the flat was of unimaginable horror police discovered the remains of dismembered and dissolved body parts. When they looked around the flat, there were buckets of dismembered body parts, including part of um, PC Semple's head. But they obviously didn't know PC Semple, so they wouldn't have known that it was him at that stage. He has to explain his actions. He's still very much under the influence of substances at this point. He's been taking crystal meth in quite large quantities for quite a significant period of time. And I think that reality really is a million miles away for him. So he's basically saying you know, that the most incredible things, like Satan, is, is responsible for, for the death of Gordon Semple. As the police secured the crime scene, they found a copy of the Satanic Bible on Brits's computer. He insisted Satan had made me kill. This was not the first time that Britsy had referred to Satan. I'm not sure I believe completely in possession, although it is a familiar enough explanation which some murderers call upon. But I would say that in this case, Britsy almost certainly believed it to be true. He had convinced himself that he was possessed and that, therefore, he had to fulfill Satan's desire. He's somebody who really has a lot of trouble at this point in time performing in a socially acceptable way. I think because his, his values and all of those types of things that inform the way we behave in front of other people are completely off kilter. He's completely lost his compass at this point in time. 
On the 7th of April 2016, Stefano Brizzi was arrested on suspicion of murder and taken to Lewisham Police Station. DNA tests and evidence found at his flat would eventually confirm that the dismembered body was in fact Gordon Semples. Brizzi would now have to reveal what happened on that fateful night. The press quickly got wind of the story. We got to the estate, um, there weren't loads of press there. There was uh, a very tight cordon around it, we couldn't get very far in. We had had a tip-off um, of his image, um, of a photograph of Stefano Brizzi, and we were trying to find out anyone who knew him. We didn't find anyone because he was living such an isolated life by that point. Police weren't willing to give us much at all because it was just so distressing, I think, particularly for Gordon Semple's family, because it had gone from being a missing person case and not being massively unusual to being a very grisly murder. So information was meted out quite slowly. It wasn't until Britsy was interrogated by police that the initial details of the murder emerged. He was very forthcoming in his interview about what happened. And the thing that always struck me about him was that he was a very um, educated and articulate man. He had an answer for everything. He wore sunglasses in his police interviews. And this is something that does appear to be incredibly bizarre. And I think what he's doing here, he's continuing to draw on that character from Breaking Bad, Walter White's alter ego of Heisenberg, who always wore sunglasses. And I think this is a way of basically psychologically detaching Stefano Brizzi from the person who's carried out this horrendous crime. Brizzi stood trial on the 18th of October at the Old Bailey he was beginning to crumble under the pressure. He was incredibly distressed. Um, at the beginning, he was uh, sobbing loudly, crying, hyperventilating. There was this difference between uh, the man we saw on CCTV and the man we saw in his police interviews and the man who was on trial, who was, in the first few days, very upset, lots of crying, lots of sobbing from the dock. One of the most incriminating pieces of evidence the prosecution had was the confession Britsy made at the time of his arrest. Britsy had abandoned his confession that he'd been told by Satan to kill someone. He gave a version in court where they'd had consensual sex, they'd had played quite a long sex game, they'd both been taking crystal meth and other chems, um, and he described a sadomasochistic sex game involving a collar and a dog lead. And the only thing that we know for certain is that that collar and this dog lead were used because they had both men's DNA on them. Britsy said in his evidence that the leash just slipped and it was an accident. But there were a lot of other aspects to the case that didn't quite tally with his version of events. First of all, he told a lot of lies uh, about what had happened. He lied to the man that came to his door to join the sex party. He then lied again, leaving messages on Gordon Semple's Grindr account. And he lied to the police after they came to his flat and discovered the body. The jury also heard that acts of cannibalism might have taken place, something that Britsy had denied. It was one of the most gruesome aspects of the case. They found evidence that Britsy's cooker had been used to cook parts of Gordon Sample's body. Um, they found various utensils in the kitchen had Gordon Sample's DNA on it, including a pair of chopsticks. And there were bite marks on a body part that was recovered. Bite marks can be very important in homicide cases. They can often associate an offender with the deceased. What's interesting to know is, have they occurred in life? Are they associated with things like bruising? Or are they post-mortem injuries? And at the worst end of the scale, if there is flesh tissue missing, is it suggesting cannibalism? CCTV footage was also played showing Britsy at the local DIY store on Tuesday the 5th of April, four days after he'd killed PC Gordon Semple. He bought several supplies, including pincers, heavy-duty scissors, a putty knife, 
and large plastic buckets. In the CCTV footage, it's very clear he's looking at the thickness, he's looking at the depth, and at one point he put his head and shoulders in one of the buckets to measure if it was big enough to take a human body. And so I think he was obviously wary that what he was about to do. His defence was that he was high on crystal meth, but he was definitely lucid enough at that point to know this is what I'm going to need or I'm going to need some heavy-duty gear here. I think you can only see Britsy as a man who is destroying himself, literally falling apart in front of your eyes. Because Semple then becomes, poor man, part of the desperate, extraordinary, bewildering land, this mad world that Britsy has found himself in, in which he thinks it's perfectly all right to dismember Gordon Semple's body. Britsy's neighbour, Steve Harris, was called to the witness stand. They showed me photographs of the bins because he went out and he was cutting him up. And there was a foot found um, in the Thames. All round here was closed off. They had suckers out in the drains. He must have flushed bits and pieces down the toilet to get rid of the evidence. The prosecution told the court that Britsy was an evil and calculating man while the defence argued that Britsy was not a monster and that he had no recollection because of heavy drug use. Britsy was assessed by a psychiatrist. Uh, they didn't find that he had a defence of diminished responsibility or any psychiatric condition that would explain what he'd done. He was clinically sane. The jury had to decide whether to believe Britsy killed in a haze of drugs, delusion and sleep deprivation or the version he told in court that it was a sex game that had gone wrong. Britsy denied murder and manslaughter, but admitted obstruction of a coroner by unlawfully disposing of the body. I didn't envy the jury. I thought they had a real tough job. It was um, 30 hours of deliberation. It was a majority verdict of 10 to 2. They obviously really struggled to reach that verdict. On the 14th of November 2016, the jury found Stefano Britzi guilty of murdering PC Gordon Semple. In December, Judge Mr Nicholas Hilliard sentenced Britzi to life in prison with a minimum of 24 years and an additional seven years for obstructing a coroner. He was sent to Belmarsh High Security Prison in London. I think there are several elements of, of Stefano Brizzi and Gordon Semple's story that are tragic. And I think for me, it was the, the missed opportunities of other people to, to intervene here. And I think here was somebody who was on his own, essentially, in a foreign country. He didn't have a lot in the way of close support networks. Uh, and I think he went off the rails and there was no one to put him back on again. So you have in Brizzi a man overwhelmed with shame conscious of his own gayness, desperate to try and do the right thing and yet finding it extremely difficult. Put together, they are a potent mixture of ingredients that could turn into a killer. I believe that Britsy, in the end, tipped over the edge. It was literally one of those moments in which this extraordinary concoction of problems exploded. The tragic death of Gordon Semple highlighted some concerns about the use of dating apps and their potential dangers. I think at the time I was also covering similar cases involving Grindr and involving predators stalking uh, social networks and, and dating apps. And this seemed to be part of a trend of cases coming through the Old Bailey. There was the Britsy case, which coincided with the Stephen Port case, which I also covered, which is a serial killer who targeted gay men on dating apps. But it seemed like a very alarming new trend. 
I think the bigger picture issue here for me is the context of social media, of dating apps, of, of this idea that we are basically just cutting out a lot of the process that we used to have around these activities and we are almost consuming our partners. We're, we're picking people almost as if they're, they're objects, as if they're products. And I think we're, we're doing so in a way that's off the radar. So we're not meeting people in social situations where our friends and our peers and our colleagues are around. We're doing it on our own, and I think that makes us quite vulnerable. On Sunday, the 5th of February, 2017, almost a year after he killed PC Gordon Semple at his flat in South London, Stefano Brizzi committed suicide and was found dead in his prison cell he was 50 years old. I think that the reason that Stefano Brizzi ended his own life was essentially because reality was catching up with him. He's now having to live with the consequences of this horrendous crime that he's committed. And also the fact that this crime not only has broken the law, but it's broken a lot of those moral expectations that were placed upon him as a, a young Catholic boy growing up in Italy. The thing that was so shocking about this case was the way um, the body was treated. That was um, sickening. Um, it was necessarily they had to go into great detail about it and that was very, very hard to listen to. That was hugely unpleasant and I can't even imagine how it must feel for um, the victim's family. It is telling that none of PC Gordon Semple's friends or family attended the trial. One can only imagine how absolutely devastating it would have been for them to have learned for the first time the details of his death and what happened afterwards. He was essentially stripped of his dignity. Stefano Brizzi's lust for sex and drugs led to the murder of an innocent man. Gordon Semple was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. For six days, Britsy, spurred on by his dark thoughts, tried to dispose of the police officer's body in the most horrendous manner. Due to the drugs that polluted his twisted mind, we may never know exactly what happened behind the door of Britsy's London home. But there is no doubt that his heinous crime means he will forever be remembered as one of the world's most evil killers.